In this video, we'll look at the various types of neural tube defects, the pathophysiology, or what we know about it anyway, ways we can prevent it, and then ways we can treat it. Neural tube defects are often also called spina bifida. So either term can refer to the same group of disorders. There are three basic levels of spina bifida or neural tube defects. The first is called occulta, and occulta means hidden. So this is where there is a defect in the bony part of the spine, but the spinal cord itself is still where it is and all the neurological function is still intact. In a meningocele, we have meninges forming a herniation. That's what that word translates to. So the lining of the spinal cord, but not the spinal cord itself, protrudes out of the patient's back and this sac is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And then in the worst form, the myelomeningocele, we have the meninges forming the hernia, but we also have myelomyelination nerves. The spinal nerves themselves are also protruding out the back. This is the form of neural tube defect that is most likely to cause neurological issues because of the damage caused by the compression of the nerves here or any force that's pressing on the back as well. Here are two other images to help you understand the entire impact. So this is a myelomeningocele on an infant's back. You can see that essentially the central nervous system is open to the surrounding environment. So infection becomes a significant concern. In this picture over here, you can see that as the spinal cord protrudes out the back, it actually pulls on the end of the brain, the brain stem, and can start to pull parts of the brain through the skull down into the spinal column. This is called hind brain herniation, and this can cause permanent damage to the brain, either causing hydrocephalus or cerebral palsy or both. Neural tube defects are caused by a failure of the neural tube to close between three to five weeks of gestation. We don't always know the exact cause for this, but we do know that there are some contributing factors. For example, certain chemical agents, whether it's medications the mother is taking or an accidental exposure to an industrial chemical or folic acid specifically or a lack of folic acid increases your risk of neural tube defects. We also know that some genetic mutations play a role. And then if there was any previous history of neural tube defects in previous pregnancies, then the risk that this pregnancy will also be complicated by a neural tube defect is increased. Prenatally, of course, our main focus is prevention, so focus on folic acid. However, a lot of women don't realize they're pregnant at three to five weeks, so we can't wait until we have a known pregnancy to supplement with folic acid. We need to focus on folic acid nutrition prior to pregnancy. So this involves widespread fortification of a lot of foods, such as cereals, breads, and other grain products. Once we know that a woman is pregnant, we can do prenatal screening. And there are three basic ways we can do this. The first is just an ultrasound. So usually around 20 weeks, they do a very thorough ultrasound to check all of the structures, the spine, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, etc., etc., to make sure basic anatomy is all intact and functioning appropriately. So sometimes we do pick up 
neural tube defects at that time, but not always. We can also do a blood test for the alpha fetoprotein concentration. That's usually done at 16 to 18 weeks. And if that's elevated, it could be a neural tube defect or it could be many other issues. So it's not very specific. We can also do chorionic villus sampling to get a better detailed picture of the health and genetics of that baby. Once we've determined that an infant does in fact have a neural tube defect, something to consider is prenatal surgery. The specialized prenatal surgical unit at CHOP in Philadelphia is one of the few hospitals in the world that will consider prenatal surgery. And their aim is to correct the defect before the infant is born to try to help prevent any of those permanent complications that can arise from injuries to the nerves in a myelomeningocele. They will only take severe cases because there are certainly significant risks associated with prenatal surgery, and you do have to stay close. So even if you're from California and you come for the surgery, you would then live in Philadelphia until your baby is ultimately delivered for the second time. The way this works is they do perform a C-section, they deeply anesthetize the mother and the baby, perform their surgery, and they put the baby back, sew everything up with sterile saline to take the place of that amniotic fluid and then they carefully monitor both mother and baby for usually uh, about 15 weeks until the baby is mature enough to actually be delivered permanently. I guess the question is which of those would be your birthday then? If you are interested in more information about that, you can, of course, check out the CHOP website, or PBS did a nice documentary called Twice Born. So you can look for that. Most infants with neural tube defects, though, are delivered after a traditional 40-week pregnancy, but we do still want a C-section birth to minimize the trauma to that neural tube defect. If you can imagine a myelomeningocele being squeezed as it comes through the birth canal, you can see that nerves will be damaged and the sac can even rupture, which just comes with a whole host of other complications, including massive risk for infection. So a, a pregnant woman will be scheduled for a C-section arrive at the hospital and one of the main things that family will need is just emotional support. It's going to be very scary, very nerve-wracking time for them. So lots of support and education. Once the infant is born, the infant is stabilized. Remember your ABCs. And then your priorities become protection of that defect and prevention of infection. Then usually within about 24 hours after birth, the infant will go for surgical closure of the defect. From that point on, it becomes more of a chronic management issue uh, and we sort of have to wait and see what neurological deficits are present in the infant before we know what chronic support they might need from us. If there was any hindbrain herniation, we also need to consider whether there are any issues with hydrocephalus that also need to be corrected at this point. This is a picture of a little girl who was born with a myelomeningocele, and you can see that she's very carefully positioned in her bassinet in the neonatal intensive care unit. So there's a rolled up towel here under her belly, and notice she is not on her back. Back to sleep does not apply to these babies. 
either before or after surgery. Now she has already had her surgical closure. You can see the bandage on her back. And also notice that the diaper is not on all the way. We don't want any extra pressure applied to that area of the back before or after surgery. Of course, it always is a little concerning that this surgical site is so close to the diaper. So we are just very careful with hygiene, with cleanliness, despite baby's propensity to poop right after birth. Notice baby also does have an IV. Usually babies will receive at least one dose of IV antibiotics to help stave off any infection. Sometimes they're actually on those antibiotics for several days. Then she also has the cardiac monitoring, some pulse ox monitoring. So even though she is laying face down, we would certainly know if she had any issues with breathing because of all the monitoring equipment we have attached to her. We do need to encourage the parents to interact with baby at this stage. This presentation of their new baby can be very intimidating and parents may feel the instinct to sort of withdraw and leave the baby alone. But we do want to encourage them to be as hands-on as possible, although we often will need to help them a little bit with positioning and uh, the best ways to care for that baby without putting any pressure on that area of the back. Okay, let's focus specifically on the nursing perspective here for a few minutes. So the priorities for nursing care in an infant born with some kind of neural tube defect, first and foremost, involves the risk for infection. Before surgery, the central nervous system is open to the environment. And even after surgery, until that incision is healed, there is a direct passageway from the outside world to the central nervous system, putting these children at very high risk for serious infection. So before birth, we cover that sac with some kind of sterile dressing and assess for any redness or drainage. And we're also constantly monitoring that infant's vital signs. Of course, we have impaired skin integrity as well. And with all the special positioning required, we just need to keep a close eye on baby's fragile skin and make sure we're not producing any excessive pressure points with that unusual positioning. And then again, also the hygiene piece with that skin as well. After surgery and as the infant is growing and developing, we'll start to pay attention to mobility and whether there are any impairments with those gross motor milestones such as rolling and crawling and walking. If we do find any delays, don't forget early intervention. We'll certainly make a referral there, get some physical therapy services, and of course, if needed, we can also provide assistive devices such as braces or crutches or even a wheelchair. If any of those devices are needed, the Spina Bifida Foundation has an excellent set of resources to allow families to explore and even experiment with a wide variety of those assistive devices. We also, if we do have impaired mobility, might see impairments in elimination as well. Usually this presents as retained stool or retained urine. So we need to develop elimination programs for these children. So there may be frequent straight calves for urinary elimination, and then things like enemas or suppositories to promote bowel elimination. Of course, the challenge is if you go overboard on the enemas and suppositories, you can end up with fecal incontinence instead. So the goal, and really the most common outcome 
is a little bit of trial and error with what we call a bowel program or bowel training until we determine what combination of assistance is needed for the child to produce a soft but formed bowel movement every day with no incontinence in between. Okay, so to wrap everything up here, we looked at the three different types of neural tube defects from spina bifida occulta, the most mild, all the way up to the myelomeningocele, the most severe. We also looked at prenatal care, prevention, and even prenatal surgery. We looked at more traditional management. And then the nursing priorities in caring for a child with spina bifida. As always, let me know if you have any questions.